webinars. And today I am proud, honored, excited to introduce Christopher Cook. And I came to the charter maybe about a few weeks before Christopher came to the charter. Um, and he was the, the first individual that I interacted with. And it was a very trying day that we had our first um, co conference call. And we were having the call with a couple of uh, Chris's students in his office um, at uh, Western Connecticut State University. And I was here, uh, I think I might have been um, at home on Bainbridge Island uh, in the state of Washington. And we were talking about the possibility of Western Connecticut University becoming a compassionate university and going through some of the processes. And uh, a student, another student, came into his office and said, there's been a shooting, um, and you should turn on the TV. And the shooting was in the backyard, practically, of uh, the university. And it was um, Sandy Hook and the horrible massacre that happened at Newtown. Uh, so that was the beginning of our relationship, and we have continued that in a number of different ways, and I think we're bonded together in the work uh, that we've been doing. Uh, there's much to say about Christopher, and it would take much, much too much time uh, in order to do that. But what we want to do is to really delve deep into uh, his brand new book, uh, the Compassion Achiever. And, but I should say that Christopher has been, um, I think, a mensch. You know, in, in Jewish tradition, there are 10 people who hold up the world. And so I, I kind of feel that, that Christopher is one of those people. Not only does he do work that involves his own areas of expertise at the university and beyond that, um, he is really our major mentor uh, for compassionate universities and colleges, uh, and he has helped so much with um, really starting at the ground level with some of the compassionate cities in the northeast of the United States. And, you know, he looks like he's young, but he's really very, very old um, and has had many lives. And some of those lives have included, um, you know, working um, in something that you might not even think that an educator would be involved in uh, as a security fellow <clears throat> at Harvard. Um, he's really delved deeply into neuroscience along with education. Uh, and he worked in counterintelligence for the United States Army. All of that. And look at him. He looks like he's 10. But um, it's exciting to have him here, and we are really grateful that he's taking his time in between classes. So, Christopher, I'm going to turn this over to you. Oh, thanks, Marilyn. Thanks for that great, uh, great introduction. And, and for me, compassion is, I think, the linchpin of strong societies, strong communities, strong teams. And I think without compassion, you get weak societies, weak countries, weak communities weak uh, teams. And so to go into compassion and to dive into it from the neuroscientific side, from the social science side, is actually something that is literally, and I didn't know this until I was writing the book, that I've been thinking about and looking at ever since basically my high school days on up. So, some playing on teams uh, from football to being on a platoon team, if you will, uh, in the military to being on Wall Street. Compassion for me, has been the key to, to drive success. And when I look at society, I, I think of how we misunderstand compassion uh, as, as a group of people, w whether it's in a classroom, whether it's in a community uh, environment, or whether it's even national politics and even international politics. We completely misunderstand it. We, and the biggest thing we misunderstand is that it's – kind of a symbol or a sign of weakness when really it's strength. And I think if you wanted to kind of see the power of the strength, I think you need to go back to Charles Darwin and what he said about compassion and how he looked at it as a key for evolutionary success. And that's where I learned a lot from my critics 
when I was first putting together this book and going out and giving talks that uh, when I would say the power of compassion leads to success, there was always inevitably someone there who was a Darwin fan, Charles Darwin fan, and said, you know, survival of the fittest. And, and survival of the fittest means you have to put someone down in order to get on top. And it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. And I decided, you know what, I need to read all of Charles Darwin because the Darwin I got was through either high school classes and or in college. And I realized it was the bumper sticker version of uh, Darwin and it never talked about compassion when I was in those classrooms. And when you sit down and read Darwin, especially The Descent of Man in chapters two, four, and five, boy, do you get a sense of the power of compassion? Because basically he says this. He says, well, first off, he says that he never coined the term survival of the fittest. There's a guy named Spencer who did that. And the way that survival of the fittest is explained is actually incorrect because Darwin argues this. He says that the species that will move up the evolutionary ladder the most efficiently and the most effectively is the species that will have the highest number of its members as, in his word, sympathetic. And Paul Ekman has shown that sympathetic means anything from altruism and empathy to compassion. That's Charles Darwin. And so when I'm thinking about writing a book, uh, you got to go back to the, to the place where everyone cites that it, compassion is a sign of weakness. And it, Darwin actually says the opposite. Compassion is the strength. It's the source of strength for any success. So, you know, when I, the, the book is about explaining that, but also how to build compassion on an individual level. Um, and it's basically a four-step program. And Marilyn, is there something that you wanted me to go into uh, on depth on, when it comes to the book? Yeah, I think it would be really wonderful if you would do ex some explanation uh, and maybe even some practical applications that come out of the book. Sure. Um, so for me, there's basically four steps to building compassion within ourselves and then across the community. And let's just make sure that we're all starting on the same page, if you will, when it comes to the definition of compassion. I define compassion as having two parts. So the first part is having a 360 degree holistic understanding of the problem or suffering of another. So you understand a problem, not just from one angle, not just from one perspective, but you have as many different multi-perspective understandings of that uh, problem uh, that's in front of you or that a person is going through. So that's the first part, a 360 degree holistic understanding. At least you try for it as best you can. And the second part is then you take action to address that problem and or suffering. So those are the two parts, an understanding and action. That's, that's my definition of compassion. And so when I was breaking it down to, you know, how do you build up the compassion muscle? It's so important to success and, at all levels. I realized that you can't, you can't have compassion unless you're a good listener. And so I start with listening, listening to learn. And let me just give you the four steps real quick, and then we can kind of go through each one. Um, the acronym for my four-step program is called LUCA, L-U-C-A. And LUCA, LUCA basically means, um, in, in many different languages, bringer of light, which is really cool. And then it also, in, in uh, science, science it stands for the last uh, uh, universal common ancestor uh, that all life on earth originated from. And I think compassion is that one common value virtue verb that all of humanity shares. I think we're born with it. I, I, I believe that uh, uh, Rousseau, uh, the, the author of the um, social contract, I, I believe what he wrote, that we are all born with natural compassion and we unlearn it through society. <clears throat> so the way we learn it is by listening, right? Listening to learn. Uh, and that's the, first, that's the L in Luca. And then the U is understand to know. Understand to know what you need to do in order to help someone. The C is connect to capabilities. Sometimes you don't have the solution inside you, but you need to connect that person with maybe an, an international organization or, or um, a, a counselor of some sort that, that, they, that can help them in a better way. So connect to capabilities. And then A is act to solve. So that's Luca. Listen, understand, 
connect, and act. And through the book, each letter has three chapters, and we're not going to go into each of the three chapters, but those three chapters break out kind of different skills uh, and, and to enhance each one. So, for example, listening to learn. We live in a society where we listen to reply. We're, li we're listening so that we can form an argument against somebody or an argument for something. We're not listening to learn what really other people are saying. And we don't take the time to do that. And I, I think that we miss a lot of key insights into how we might address a problem, how we might address suffering, if we just took the time to listen. And one of the things that I do, one of the ways I, I build that skill set is I, I'm a big podcast fan. And uh, we just started um, the Compassionate Achiever podcast last year. And we're into our second season right now where we interview people from across all walks of life who use compassion as a way to succeed. But I'm such a fan of podcasts that I realized that I was subscribing to podcasts at one point that really reinforced my own way of thinking. And so I realized if I really want to listen to learn, I, I need to listen to really the people who disagree with my my own perspective. And I, listen, I need to listen all the way through. And one of the reasons I came up with that is that if I didn't listen to my critics when it came to survival of the fittest and Charles Darwin, I never would have found out that Charles Darwin actually supported compassion in a, in a significant way. So I listen to podcasts that are diametrically opposed to the way I'm thinking right now. And I listen all the way through and without shutting it off, without yelling at it or arguing against it. And what's really amazing is how many bits of truth that I would have missed by not listening to someone who is on another side uh, of, of it, uh, of, of whatever I'm thinking of. And so when you're building up a listening to learn capability, it's listening to learn to all different perspectives, not just the one that you agree with. So that, that's just one way of enhancing that skill. Understand to know, uh, understand to know, that's, that's a lot of fun to me as well, for the fact that it's about seeing the world as interconnected. And so when you're understanding to know what you need to do in order to help somebody, you're looking at all ways that a problem or suffering arose, and maybe the underlying values that you don't see, or the issues that are driving a problem or, or contributing to uh, a problem. But it's also a way to look forward and how you're going to address a problem, how you're going to act upon it, how are you going to connect, who you're going to connect to. And so understanding to know is not just having knowledge, because I think really smart people <laughs> did the 2008 economic crisis and they had a lot of knowledge, but they didn't see the interconnections between people. And so they created uh, an economic crisis that they benefited from, but the rest of society didn't. And so they were missing the connections. And the connections are what key to understanding. And let me give you an example. So one of the, the, the ways I practice that is to say, okay, what is, I'm looking at something, a flower on my desk. A flower by itself is simply one, one flower. But if you put flowers and connect them together, it changes that idea of a flower into a bouquet, right? And that bouquet has a different way of how people are looking at it. It's different than one flower. It's different than one rose. Having a bouquet um, gives you different uh, smells. And those smells combined together give you a different smell than if they were just by themselves. And I think seeing how things connect, even similar things connect, and how they change the dynamic makes you understand that just by simply interconnecting something with something else, you get to see a solution, uh, a way to move forward. You understand something uh, better than you normally would. So it's, it's really an understanding to know is about connecting the dots, if you will, with the knowledge that you do have. Uh, connecting to capabilities. Uh, a lot of that is about seeing multiple perspectives and even multiple identities, not just with other people, but for yourself. For example, we are all many different people at different times 
throughout even a given day. So this morning, for instance, this morning I started off, my, you know, my youngest son was sick. I started off right when I woke up being a dad and taking care of him. But as I took care of him, I went and made coffee for my wife. I was also a husband. And I'm also, you know, I'm owned by a pet basically too. So I'm a pet owner uh, too and taking care of, uh, of our dog. But then coming here, I'm also a professor, right? And, and now I'm a colleague, I'm working with Marilyn. So we have these different roles that we, that we partake every single day. And in those different roles, we also see the world differently, even though we may not acknowledge it consciously, subconsciously we do. And if we can tap into those multiple identities that we have in any given problem, we can connect to solutions or connect to capabilities that we might not normally have. And so in the book, I give an example. When I um, was a, a teenager, I was one of the few male babysitters in my town. And so for some of the families, when they had boys, they wanted to have a male babysitter. And you know, I, I raked it in pretty good as a babysitter. But I remember one night the power going out. And the young, uh, the young baby that I was in charge of always had music that he fell asleep to. And I would put on a classical radio. Uh, station, but obviously without the power, I didn't have that. And I also play guitar, and I was in in a choir, and I happened to bring my guitar with me everywhere. I happened to have my guitar there, so I took out my guitar to solve the issue that was happening. The baby wasn't going to sleep, and I couldn't, as a babysitter, just turn on the radio. I had to become the musician, and it was probably my best performance ever because that guy fell asleep right away after I took out the guitar. So we connect to capabilities. We find solutions to problems by also connecting to the different identities that we have. So, um, so Chris, can I just yeah. interrupt at this time because you have a question uh, from one of the participants uh, that might fit here. And it said, um, how can we invade other countries when we cannot listen to them because we do not know their language or their real culture? And this is a real problem, especially if you see and read the press right now. Um, in one of my classes, I signed a Wall Street Journal and New York Times piece showing that the Trump administration wants to pull back and cut the State Department, over 30% cut on the State Department and not filling some key positions. For example, as of this webinar, we do not have a U.S. ambassador to South Korea. And North Korea, right, when I'm, when I'm looking at how can we invade other countries, right, one of the countries that is probably on the list right now is North Korea and some type of conflict. I, I, we have to be able to, to listen. We need to have a strong State Department. There are eyes and ears in the different embassies. There are also American experts in those cultures. They know the language. They know the values. They know the traditions. And when we pull back on our understanding of that, we actually create more problems. Uh, instead of finding solutions that are diplomatic and peaceful, the only solutions that will be out there are or th through the military. That is a serious problem when it comes to international pro uh, politics, when we don't listen. I think it's a problem on all levels, but the question is how can we invade other countries when we cannot listen to them? I don't think we have a right to. We also have this concept of sovereignty in the international arena that was, that was established, what, back, what was, it, um, was it, 1648, that we, as a world, respect the borders of other countries. And we do need to listen to them. Um, but we, in order to listen to them, we need to have that diplomatic core up and, and going so that we not only listen to them, we have this kind of understanding to know about them. We're not just looking at facts or figures or military missiles that they may have. We also need to know their intentions, their perspective on the world. Is that, you want me to go in a little further, Marilyn, or? Well, let's, let's kind of turn on the mic uh, for, for Lynn. Um, let me see if I can do that. The person who asked the question. Um, Lynn, do you, do you, would you like to, um, to talk more about your question or ask uh, anything else about it? I turned your mic on, so I'm 
Perhaps not. I see that she's still muted. Oh, is she? Yep. Wow. There she is. Hello. Okay. There she is. <clears throat> yes, I'm just wondering what your take on uh, Christopher that how we can. Um, okay, there's. Oh, thank you for. Oh, thank you for doing this. Um, Michael Moore put a movie out, and people have these, you know, cruxes against him, whatever. So they'll have these different blocks just in our culture alone. When he wrote his book and movie, Where to Invade Next, and yet it's nothing about military. It's about government policies that he went to other countries and show what we as Americans could do with invasion as, as um, far as bringing in real democracy, new education, all kinds of beautiful projects and programs in different cultures that would be so compassionate that we'd be adding um, the development of compassion at, at a level of interconnected for world healing and peace. And these are government policies from these countries that, and he says, we started them like the Norway. Have you seen that movie? No, I have not. Yeah. I, it's so critical because the compassion levels of education and understanding for children, for um, cap and trade on large um, free markets, what he does with, um, the Norway, what I mean, it makes you cry that the, the, the uh, restorative justice in Norway is so phenomenal. And um, then he goes into no more arrest in, in Portugal. They don't arrest in 2000. They quit arresting for drugs, their drug policy. They do healing alternative, you know, modalities for healing for all these different addictions and mental health problems. And then they you know, give them jobs, not jails, and it just goes on and on. Yet even that, that block, that our government will not get that out to the political groups, like political science groups, and show it, and have it shown that these are government policies so needed on a people's platform for building compassion and, and, and healing and world healing and peace. And it's not being... It's blocked even here. You know, they want to block net neutrality. Right. Sorry. Right. Okay. Right. No, no, that's, I love your passion, huh. um, without a doubt. And, but it does start, I mean, at the most basic level, and I mean the most basic level with all of, all of us individually. I, I truly believe in the power of you know, what Mother Teresa said, that one act of kindness can act as a ripple th throughout, but also one act of teaching how to, ask better questions see when you when i when i'm thinking of the nordic countries when i think of you know norway and finland and 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 my my father's home country of estonia and, and, and the baltics what's really interesting is about the different types of education to land right that go literally from the ground up from pre-k all the way up yeah. it's not filling in little bubbles on a you know a multiple multiple choice sheet it's about asking better questions. It's about an understanding, it's that understanding to know, right? That we, we test kids here on basic knowledge. That's what multiple choice uh, exams are. And that's what these standardized testing really is. It's, it's basic knowledge, not an understanding. It's not putting together the different pieces of knowledge in order to get a more holistic viewpoint, a, a better understanding, a 360 degree understanding. So in those countries, you have an emphasis on education that is inclusive, that includes social and emotional learning, not separates it from the everyday you know, learning. It's part of learning, it's ingrained, it's woven into the fabric of education. We have backed out of that. We, we don't do that. We've, we put so much emphasis on, on standardized testing that understanding has taken a back seat. And I think it's, it was by accident. And it's a byproduct of the way we, we run our education system. But when you, when you have to find ways to get social emotional learning in to an everyday school, that's a problem. I, I think it, it takes away that act of compassion, right? Our kids on the playground 
what do they play? They play games like King of the Hill, where you push other kids down so that you stay on top, right? And and a lot of a lot of uh, parents are having to do two jobs, so they're not home on the social emotional learning side. But when I think of Finland and I think of Estonia and I think of you know Norway, it's woven into the fabric of who they are, and we need to get back to doing that. So how do you feel about um, the possibility of um, these new education, teaching, training, opening centers instead of, you know, one of my, a friend of mine, well, she just retired a judge, said that we could actually take the, the, the um, uh, jails and take 90% of the jails and the bases, military bases and what have you, and prisons and 90% and shift them over for housing the homeless, tiny houses and, and remodeling programs and teaching training centers. And then also to the churches, shouldn't they be opened up and, and be areas where people can come in, be taught heart and soul, heart math classes and soul um, projects and programs and who they really are. Then you network them and they know some people aren't even here for, for, um, um, for, they're not really even here for people. They're actually here for animals, and even some of them for certain kinds to help them, or water, or air. Or, you know, they'll know. And if you know, we could start those kind of new um, job creations instead of teaching people war, militarized policing, and you know, we could actually have people in community saying, yeah, this person's really getting whacked out. They need healing, you know, and take them into the churches. Shouldn't they be set up as Christ-centered churches, especially even the, the other churches? If they united, if all the churches unite in spiritual groups and do more of seeing and more of the healing work, like hands-on healing process programs, they're in Harvard Medical. They're, in, they're happening in NASA. You know, we should be teaching and training hands-on healing and, and, and uh, soul work instead of, and heart and soul work instead of all these drugging and jailing and killing process programs of violence. Yeah, well, there's a lot in there, Linda, <laughs> that I have to, have to parse out. <laughs> compassion, compassion. Well, that's, to me, that's the line, you know, and when I, so first off, there has to be a reinvestment in human in, in human capital, right? And the mm -hmm. economists call human beings human capital, right? So let's just go with the economist uh, term. Mm -hmm. We need to have a reinvestment in that. Instead, we're having investments in our military increases, mm -hmm. right? Right. And so there needs to be a policy change that reinvests into the strength of the United States. That's its people, mm -hmm. right? We need that. I think you're absolutely right, but we've been going in the opposite direction lately. <laughs> we're, we're investing in military hardware not necessarily into the people, right? And so that, I think you're right. I think that needs to change, but that's a, that's a policy shift that people have to go to the polls in order to make that difference, right? Mm -hmm. They have to become engaged citizens. And I think being compassionate and being a compassionate citizen is automatically an engaged citizen. You can't sit just on the, on, on the sidelines. And, and when it comes to um, police, I write an example about it in, in, in the book where there was a, a young policeman who was called to a grocery store because a woman was caught shop, shoplifting. And, and this is where, he, to me, he was a compassionate achiever. He was a compassionate policeman because you know what he did? The, the grocery store wanted him to arrest her, but instead he asked, why are you stealing? And she said, I have three grandchildren at home mm. and we don't have food. So he said, can, if I take you there, can you show me? So he drove her there, saw that these children were in dire circumstances, took her back to the grocery store, bought her the groceries <laughs> that she was going to be stolen, and, and has helped her and helped that family out, right? But it's by simply asking a question, why? Instead of putting on the cuffs, he put on his questioning, <laughs> right? And he, so he got to understand to know what was needed to do and help to resolve the problem. So there's someone who didn't get a jail, jail time, someone who didn't get separated from her, her grandkids, mm -hmm. who can stay in, in their lives. And, and there's a policeman who actually, you know, took a constructive step to make, make all that happen. So you know, it goes back to starting with us on an individual 
as a professor, as a police officer, whatever we are, and showing that line of compassion, showing that kindness, but it also demands us to become active in our, not just national politics, but local and state politics as well. And when I think of churches, we brought up churches, you know, there, someone's asked me, what am I, right? Because I was raised Catholic, but recently I was told that I should find another parish because I stood up for same-sex marriage. And love is love to me. And Jesus, in my perspective, Jesus had love. He did not marginalize anybody. He accepted everybody. And, and he taught us that love is love. And so someone asked me, what am I? I said, I'm a stoically Buddhist Catholic. <laughs> I, 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 I weave different strands of thought together, but I draw the line with compassion. If something that I do hurts somebody else, it's wrong, right? If something do, helps everyone else, then I, I follow it. And, and so when I have a friend who, and I write about him in the book, that asked me to go to dinner with him because he was thinking about disowning his lesbian daughter. And I, I said, why? And, you know, he quoted Leviticus, and that's where, you know, some, you know, traditional Catholics go to. And he goes, see, it's quite clear in the word of God. And I said, you're right. And I said, but why aren't you following the quite clear words of God in other parts of Leviticus? And he goes, what do you mean? We were at, Lynn, we were at a Red Lobster restaurant. And in Leviticus, it says that it's a sin to eat, right? The shellfish, right? And so I said, so why are we there? It also is a sin to charge money and make money by loaning money. Guess what his job was? A bank manager, right? And it says in Leviticus not to make money by selling food. What are grocery stores? Right? So we pick and choose what we want to follow. And so he asked me, he goes, how do you pick and choose? Simple. By compassion. Because I think that's what Jesus did. He did his actions by compassion. And I think we've forgotten that in some churches, right? They, they see a distinction, an, an exclusion rather than inclusion. And to me, I don't think that's a church. I think that's doing something else. I think that's indoctrination, right? And it, that happens in education and it happens in religious life and it happens in all life. And I think we need to learn how to achieve, how to succeed in this world by following compassion. And compassion is in every religion, and it predates religion. No religion owns compassion, right? But it is part of humanity. And, and I think Dr. Tanya Singer in, um, in Germany has shown how it's a part of our neuroscience. It's a part of who we are as human beings. And I think in society, Lynn, and some of your, your points, we've unlearned it, as Rousseau, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau has said. Do you have, do you know about um, the development of nurturing, caring community coalitions? Uh, no, I, I've heard of them, but I, I haven't been a part of that. They're just really awesome. What they're, um, it's sort of a precursor for what I see as cities of enlightenment or compassion and peace and green jobs. But they have a, they actually have a um, uh, application form that actually reaches out to be used in the schools and throughout um, the communities and, and um, actual, well, this one that we have is set up for reaching out to uh, the, the uh, county wide programs. And uh, we have in our county, there's only like 65,000 people and we have um, 637 uh, 501 C3s. So, you know, and they're charities, right, so to speak, or nonprofits that are, okay, so then we also have these businesses that need single payer in through our systems. Um, so we really need the single payer. And I've been trying to get so that the, the small businesses can create more small businesses and apprentice programs for people, right? but we need to get single payer through our country. Then the other one is um, the co-ops, the ability to build new co-ops. So if we have heart and soul community services with a basic guaranteed income, with single payer for everyone, we can have new co-ops, new small businesses, and we can develop 
the outreach, which you already have for volunteers, but they're paid to volunteer at a heart and soul level instead of going to war, instead of being taught and trained more violence and militarized, militarized policing, you know, and more killing. And, you know, the, the armed force services have gotten out of hand. You know, they, it's just, it needs, no, it's too, it's wrong. We just can't be teaching and training and going that direction. And the poor people are still being coerced. So I'm right. really pleased that you're coming forward to, to speak up on this. Thank you so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank I was going to just say, Lynn, if you could use the chat box and if you wanted to uh, direct people to some of uh, the organizations that you were talking about, that would be great. And I just wanted to let Christopher know that you just have about 20 minutes uh, to go. So if you want to continue along the line of, um, you know, getting us through the steps of Luca. Sure. Okay. Well, and we were almost there, right? So we did listening yeah. to learn, mm -hmm. understand to know, connect to capabilities and finally is act to solve right is is actually getting out there and and doing something for um for solving that that problem or addressing the suffering and one of the kind of paradoxical ways i, I want to highlight because i get to it in the book but you know it's, it's also fun to have a discussion about it i think too is the act of non-doing and i was able to um i was fortunate enough here to host uh, Lema Bowie, uh, Nobel Peace Prize laureate here on campus. And she was able to spend two and a half days with our students and um, high school students throughout the, the, the area. And you know, she talks about the power of non-doing, about literally sometimes sitting and thinking about doing something or purposely not doing something so that it gets addressed by the person who's doing it and it almost empowers them. Um, to, to actually address the solution on their own. And let me just give you an example of, of what I mean by that, that as a dad, um, I, I want to help my kids as much as I possibly can, but sometimes I'd overhelp. I, I can overhelp. I can do something that they can do on their own and probably get a better life lesson out of it than if I actually stepped in. And so my oldest son um, had some significant medical issues uh, when he was younger, and he... Um, his oxygen levels were, were quite low. They were hovering anywhere between 80 to 85%. So his breathing was very labored in and out. And when he was getting better, when it was around 85, 86%, um, he wanted to try to go back to school, but he still sounded like Darth Vader, the son of Darth Vader. And I was worried that the students would, uh, uh, his, his colleagues would, would pick on him. So I said, you know, you want me to go to school and kind of set the you know, stage for what, what's going on uh, with you in terms of your, of your um, the medical problems. And he goes, dad, no, he goes, I want to do it. And so I had to pull back. And my, my instinct as a father was to try to step in and help him. And, but then he went, he went into class the first, the first day I was waiting for a phone call and never came. He came back on the bus. And I said, so what happened? He goes, well, I started off with a Darth Vader joke. And he put everyone at ease and he was able to then field questions from his colleagues where both not only me, but his mom and his teachers thought he might get bullied. He was able to handle it for himself. And it's a great life lesson to show that you can also laugh at yourself, even when you're going through a tough time. And when other people see that, they, they're there to support you. And, you know, as, a, as an eight-year-old to learn that lesson, you know, that was something I had to not do. I had to step back um, to allow it to happen. And so it solved, he was able to solve his, his problem um, by himself. So the act to solve sometimes includes the act of not doing. And when you put the, the, the four steps together and there's different ways of, of doing that and context matters, right? So when you have one solution in one area, it's not necessarily going to work in the other. And that's where you, you always strive for this 360 degree uh, movement with Luca. And the models, uh, compassionate achievers are all around us. And even in economics, uh, I think that one of the areas where I found that compassion had the most return, uh, the highest dividends is actually in the business world and seeing examples of that throughout throughout life, you have uh, Target, 
You have General Mills who wove, wove in compassion and mindfulness into their workplaces. And when they did that, they saw increases in their profit. And, 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 the, and the, the basics are, there are really a lot of different reasons for it, but think about working in a place where compassion is, is, is running free, is, is running rampant, right? People don't want to leave a place like that. So you have low employee turnover. That means lower costs and retraining. That means you don't have to go out and advertise uh, for positions. People stay, people want to enhance it. They want to enhance their jobs. Um, and neuroscientifically, when you're working in a place where compassion is running, running free, you also, we now know through neuroscience, right, that compassion, and when you think compassionately, you release the peptide hormone called oxytocin. And oxytocin is that kind of hug, that warm, that, that, that warm feeling you get. But that, more importantly, it releases and activates two neurotransmitters called dopamine and serotonin. Dopamine is that high reward that you're, you're psyched about. For me, uh, when I see my wife, I get a dopamine high, or when I drink chocolate milk, I get a dopamine high. And then serotonin is that calming, that calming, calming neurotransmitter. And so think about a workplace that people are feeling optimistic and hopeful and high, and, and also calm at the same time. It's a place that ideas and innovation are gonna also run rampant because they're willing to take a risk. They're willing to become innovative. They're willing to a ask questions that can move a business, business forward. So really, I don't, I don't care what, what position you are or what, where you're located. Um, it could be in the economics, it could be in academia, but even in counterintelligence. I was able to sit down, um, I was a low level counterintelligence agent during the Cold War, but the gentleman I was able to interview for the book you know, he, you guys, we all know him as M in James Bond movies, but we called him C. He was the chief of MI6. And I was able to ask him about my anecdotal um, experience when it came to compassion in, in counterintelligence. So even in counterintelligence, it matters. Because he said this. He said, the most successful agents were the most compassionate agents. The least successful were the uncompassionate ones. And he, and he said the reason for that is that compassionate agents are able to cultivate sources, are able to cultivate trust so that they get more information from their sources. And when you have, he said this, and he was allowed me to quote, quote this, he says, when you have people who are promoting what you Americans called enhanced interrogation, which is a fancy way of saying torture, he says, when you have in people who are, are for that, for enhanced interrogation, you get the information you want, not the information you need. So even in military, even in the counterintelligence realm, compassion leads to bigger, broader, <laughs> wider success. So from economics to academics to learning to counterintel, compassion is the key for driving success forward. So, Chris, do you want to move on and just kind of finish with Luca? Sure. It's basically it was act to solve. Um, so, the just as to sum it all up, um, Luca is listen to learn. So, the first thing you want to do, if you you know, someone's asked me, what's the first thing I can do to become compassionate? I said, improve your listening skills. We all need to improve our listening skills. And that's what I was trying to do with Lynn. Lynn was, had so much passion. She said so many different things. That I wanted to try to make sure I got the three things she, she nailed. I had to really listen uh, to, to, to her in order to address her questions. We don't do that enough. So listen to learn, understand to know. So connect concepts, connect facts together to create a mosaic, to create a picture of the world that you truly understand that you can perceive. So that's understand to know, connect to capabilities, broaden your network, right? So on, even on social media, right? That if you just have one type of friend that you subscribe to and not someone who has a different uh, opinion or different, uh, or different sources, you're going to be limited in your solutions. You're going to be limited in your thinking. So broaden your network to include people who have, you know, divergent um, uh, I ideas. So connect to capabilities and then finally act to solve. Luca. Listen, understand, connect, and act. And that's it. And that's great. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I wanted to um, just to let Lynn and other people on this call know that, and I, I wrote it in the chat box, 
that we've started a new strategic partnership with an organization called Think Equal. And I put it on um, the chat box so that you have a link uh, to Think Equal. And it's an organization that is working uh, to bring about a compassionate curriculum uh, throughout the world. And they are starting with three to five-year-olds. And uh, the Berlitz organization has come on board, so they're willing to translate all of the material. Wow. Uh, and so we have started to work with, and Chris will appreciate this, the folks in Nueve Leon uh, to bring the program uh, there. And each year, as they move forward, they will be adding another grade level. So that it is that emotional, intelligence, compassionate education that has been missing. So anyone on this call who might be interested um, in finding out about Think Equal, go to their website, but then do contact us because one of the things that we can do is to begin the process of introducing it in compassionate communities around the world. And that's, um, that's a real big drive, especially for the next few years. Um, and it's in Australia right now, Canada, um, 19,000 school children involved in Sri Lanka. Uh, so it's, it's a wonderful movement. So I, there's, there's some hope there. And um, I think that you know, we will be wanting to, to try and bring that throughout uh, our communities. I'm counting on Chris. He's going to bring it to the Northeast. So uh, that'll be great. I'm wondering if anyone else has any um, questions, please. Uh, I'm looking in the question and answer box. There isn't anything, but and um, nothing in the chat box. I try to capture some of the main points that Chris was talking about. And there is a wonderful feature in Zoom uh, at the bottom of the chat box. Uh, you'll see more and you can actually save your chat. So any of the links, I, I also uh, put Michael Moore's film in there. Uh, so that uh, Chris especially can go and get a copy of Where to Invade Next. And I agree with Lynn. It's quite an incredible film. Um, and I think that anyone on this call would certainly find it of, of interest. Well, this is great. And Chris, I did send you a message that uh, as you go to, um, to Drexel, uh, Harriet uh, Levin Millen is the person yeah. uh, there who has worked with the charter. Right. And so I'll make an introduction. And I, I think that uh, her students, uh, since she teaches writing classes, especially would be very interested in uh, hearing you. I would love, yeah. I would love that. that. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Most welcome. So thanks everyone. Uh, and I think we do have another webinar before uh, the, uh, the end of the year. Uh, it's with the three amigos, uh, and I, they are always very, very in, entertaining. Um, a rabbi, an imam, and a Christian minister. So um, they have good things to say in a in a great way. So uh, you know, check the the homepage of the charter for that link. And as always, we really appreciate you coming on board. And uh, if you're uh, open sometimes to uh, sending us a donation for these free webinars, we would also really appreciate that. Uh, up throughout this year, we've had between two and three a week. Uh, so um, we feel that, you know, we've been blessed with all the people like Christopher, uh, who have come along and, uh, and really helped to challenge our thinking, widen our perspective, and uh, generally just make us great people. Now, all of a sudden, we're getting some, um, some things. Uh, thank you. Keep up your outstanding work. That's to you. Um, Chris, I'm quite sure. And uh, Lynn has uh, certainly uh, given us some uh, links here. So, um, you know, please again, uh, download the chat so that you'll have all of these things. So Chris, thanks again. And um, we're looking forward to a great year uh, next year. And we're going to be listening hard. <laughs> all right, yes. <laughs> okay. Take care, Thank everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.